So I would like to begin by expressing my gratitude uh, to Professor David and Professor Kathleen Caulfield and our colleagues uh, in uh, Ustana Campus, University of Alberta. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I have been to play this place uh, before, and the beautiful, of course, environment. Um, I also thank for this uh, compliments. I wish I deserve. I try to do justice to my topic, and maybe without any further delay, I just go straight forward to uh, the presentation. When I was asked last night uh, by Professor David about the nature of his course, and I tried to put all my ideas together in a PowerPoint, you know, uh, presentation. Uh, it's a narrative class, so I thought maybe better to show what I would say uh, uh, during my uh, discourse. I don't know how many of you are uh, familiar with uh, Sufism. Uh, am I clear and loud? Mm -hmm. For, okay. Uh, so Sufism, I just make maybe some uh, uh, introductory remarks about Sufism, how it emerged, and then I will move straight to Jesus is upon me in the uh, super traditions. And maybe during the discussion, I can relate uh, the depiction of Muhammad also, you know, uh, in our uh, course. Sufism, uh, this, and as you uh, might have seen, uh, began with uh, traditionally in emulation of the Prophet Jesus and his uh, disciples, who used to wear woolen garment, which was white in color. That uh, represents asceticism, or kind of denunciation of the world of pleasures, or retreat. And uh, so the name of the woolen garment has been known in Arabic suf, which means wool. Uh, this is uh, uh, Sufi had how it came about later. This is one of the theories as far as the origin of his Sufism is concerned. Of course, Sufism means Islamic mysticism in a loose fashion. Then uh, there is the second version or theory with regard to the origin of Sufism. It is again from Arabic, the term Saf, which means purity of the heart, because soon Sufis put so much emphasis on the journey within the heart. And it, it begins by cleansing and by controlling us or curbing, you know, uh, like uh, carnal desires, in a sense. So, and the one who puts himself into this process of cleansing or purification is not known as Sufi. Okay. The new purity, the one who uh, aims to purify his heart. And, and, uh, and the third one is coming from the time of the Prophet Muhammad when he was in Medina, the second city of Islam, where his uh, tomb and, of course, mosque uh, located. And, and here, uh, inside his mosque, there was a platform uh, which had a bench and where uh, homeless uh, companions of Muhammad took shelter and learned from him you know, his wisdom and his uh, knowledge. And the, these people known as the people of the bench, Ashab Sufa. So this is how Sufa, Suf. So there are three, uh, but the first one uh, is taken by the majority of the experts on Sufism. That is the beginning of the technical term Sufi. Okay. Then, uh, of course, as I explained these things, and it is, uh, kind of emulation of the early Muslims uh, of Jesus and his uh, simplicity, humility, and, and uh, of course, uh, uh, or denunciation of the world uh, at large. Uh, now, if you have any questions about the development of Sufism, because this class is not about Sufism, it is about how uh, Jesus has been conceived in Sufi tradition. I have two figures to introduce to you today. And one of them, one of them is known as Ibn Arabi, 
Muhyiddin ibn Arabi, he represents the Western Islam who, who grew up in the 13th century in Muslim Spain. Okay. And he is known as the greatest uh, mystic of the Western Islam. And he is the one who put into articulation of the early Sufi doctrines. And he wrote about, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, for example, four volume books. It's called Futuhat and Mekkiyye. Uh, within 33 years when he was uh, staying in Mecca, the holy site of, of, co of course, Islam, and his Meccan revelations. And, you, and this book that, uh, consists of four volumes, and each volume has about, you know, uh, uh, two, um, uh, about 15 uh, and chapters big, and each chapter is amount to uh, 150 pages. So he has a huge book with four volumes. Uh, so he is the first, probably, uh, imaginary Sufi. It's called visionary uh, Sufi. And I begin uh, with him because it's very interesting. And then I move to my town, to Konya, where I will give an example of Rumi. And, and he, in his poetry, in his literature, how Jesus was understood and, and, and transmitted to his followers. <laughs> so, Ibn Arabi, look at this poem, and I have this Arabic version of it with me, and very interesting sometimes, very difficult to translate from the, from the Arabic. And look at my heart has become capable of every form, a pasture for gazelles, a cloister for monks, a temple for idols, the water is Kaaba, of course, and the tablets of the Torah, the scroll of the Quran, it is the religion of love that I hold. Wherever it turns its mouth, love shall be my religion and my faith. And this is, of course, from his Tarjuman uh, uh, al um, meaning the, uh, the book of the lovers, and uh, translated by Nicholson in source into English, and edited. So Ibn Arabi was a critic of the philosophers uh, holy reliance on reason, dependence on reason. And of, of course he was a reasonable man, he used reason, but uh, not the pure absolute reason. In the sense, he more in, in favor of intuitive knowledge, knowledge that occurs to the heart as a result of this process of preparation, of contemplation and meditation. And uh, of course his uh, doctrine, uh, which made uh, uh, fame in the Anatolian context in, in the Muslim world as the unity. Oh, sorry, I can take my back. So, you still uh, see? his doctrine in, in, in philosophy or mystical mm -hmm. philosophy has been known as the unity of being. And in Persian, all we see of is wherever I look. Wherever I see, wherever I turn, there is nothing but see the face of God. And this is, of course, unity of all beings, his philosophy. And there, there, have, uh, there are some studies, by the way, in this context, a comparison between Spinoza's pantheism and Ibn, Ibn Arabi's, uh, you know, monotheism, so to speak. You know. If Muslims are careful in using the notion of pantheism, they say, uh, rather consider him to be a defender of monotheism because in his own way, in a minute of being. Now, uh, this, now I begin, I begin by going through with you uh, how he conceived uh, uh, Jesus uh, in his writings. First he said, when he was child, when he was going through his early education, he had a number of visions of Jesus. And he says, Jesus was my first guide to take me to the road, to the path of God. And this is, uh, you know, and he says he learned from him the necessity of asceticism as he learned from Moses that he would attain the hidden esoteric knowledge. Okay, so two, uh, of course, the uh, prophetic figures, one uh, Jesus, one Moses, and one represents for him the you know, door of intuitive knowledge, one represents for him the simplicity, humility of life. So Jesus was there for him to be a guide to take him to the path of God. And he also claims that he had inherited all the signs of the Prophet Muhammad. And now, um, there is a notion in Islamic mysticism which is very similar to sainthood, although there are differences. 
uh, between you know Christianism and uh, Islam or Sufism, and this is called Wali. We have of course Quranic reference for that, and it is known as the friend of God. So Ibn Arabi claims himself to be the sole inheritor of the sainthood of the Prophet Muhammad, and but he had this knowledge also from the uh, uh, wisdom of Jesus. And so he says, among the signs was the knowledge that no one after him, except Jesus, at the end of time would be Muhammad's plenary inheritor. So no one after him, with the exception of Jesus, would inherit the prophetic word, states and knowledge. So he himself, he saw himself as the seal of Muhammadan sainthood, for, uh, or, or Muhammadan and friendship. And I go through from, from his works, and these are just my, <coughs> my uh, translations. Uh, the seal of the wisdom of the Prophet Muhammad consisted in the word of the Prophet Jesus, he says. So, as, uh, so Jesus for Muslims, as you see, from the very beginning, uh, uh, has been taken by them as a symbol, as a resource for developing mystical or esoteric understanding of Islam or mystical dimension of Islam because he, he is seen as also the uh, and collector or depositor of hidden treasures of God and of course and, uh, and Muhammad also uh, had that treasure of, of you know, uh, wisdom so Jesus is manifested, he says from the water of Mary, very interesting from the breath of Gabriel, in the form of man existing from clay. And he is a spirit from God again from the Quran. God purified, purified his body and made his spirit pure and made him a model of taking form. Again, the body of Jesus was created from the actual water of Mary and from the imaginary, imaginary water of Gabriel, which was infused in the moisture of that breath. So this is, you know, the God breath, breath breathed into the uh, womb of Mary and uh, the Quran. So he's giving reference. So the body of Jesus is, the, is from both imaginary and real water. And he emerged in the form of man in respect to his mother. And inasmuch as Gabriel had appeared in the form of man, since taking form only occurs in the human species according to the normal principle. So he's trying to, you know, deal with the human aspect and spiritual aspect or divine aspect of Jesus, you know, in, in his uh, 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 ideas, in his own thought. Then he says, now, of course, he lists, and I will not go through all the miracles that were taken as those examples by Sufis uh, as reference, reference points. And he speaks about, for example, the bringing the dead to life or reviving the dead. He says the bringing the dead to, the, to life is ascribed to Jesus by means of actualization in one aspect and by imagination in another aspect. In respect to actualization, it is said of him that he brings the dead to life. In respect to imagination, it's said that he breathed into it and it becomes a bird by the leave of God. So again, this is his interpretation of relevant verse of the Quran in reference to Jesus' miracles, especially the reification of, of the dead. And why Jesus is so important for Sufis, and Ibn Arabi here illustrates this. He says, Jesus showed humility to the extent that he prescribed that his community pay the poll tax, for example, with their hands in a state of complete abasement. So if one of them were slapped on the cheek, he should offer the other cheek, of his very, very well known, of course, uh, motto, a uh, cheek to the one who slapped him and not rise up against him, nor seek revenge, you know, uh, of him. This came, he says, again in Arabi, from his form, his mother's side, who was a symbol also of humility, and like a Mary. Now, if you have questions, we come back to the Arabi. Now, let me move to uh, Rumi. Okay, Rumi again, 13th century uh, Sufi, uh, people consider him to be a humanist. Um, for, for us, as far as Islamic civilization is concerned, one of the pioneering, you know, uh, uh, intellectual and scholar and, and mystic, of course. Uh, he is a Muslim and he lived, of course, in Konya 
and he died 1273, and there is no need for me, I guess, to make any further introduction. He's already well known, and he is the founder of the Berlin Dervishes, you know, the Sufi orders. So, and they say that he was the most creative Sufi poet. I, sometimes I have this reservation for the use of the term superlative the most, but since he has been acclaimed as such, I, I better use the, you know, the reference. So, he uh, composed in, in uh, Persian, in Arabic, in Turkish books, but his, uh, the most uh, well-known work of Rumi is his poetry, Masnevi, which means couplets. And it consists of about 30,000, to be accurate, 26,600 something couplets, okay, where uh, uh, he gives from his own mystical perspective a reality of the world and uh, how he perceives the reality, how he perceives, you know, uh, humanity. And at the center of his teaching there lies this uh, 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 precious uh, or dignified status of human being. And uh, so, uh, among probably uh, the commentaries after the Quran, his Masnavi was the most commented by the Muslims. So therefore he made, uh, you know, uh, almost every century you can find uh, commentaries on his works. And uh, the, uh, for his followers, the poetry of uh, Rumi uh, stands for um, the versified translation of the Quran in Persian language. Therefore they call it Zabani Farisi. Uh, it means the Persian uh, interpretation language of the, of the Quran. And uh, there are, of course, uh, 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 interpretation of the verse of the Quran, also stories, and it's a full of collection of Eastern and Western and religious wisdom in his poetry. He says now about Mary. Look at this. We are like that story of Mary in the Quran. Every one of us has a Jesus within, but until the pangs manifest, our Jesus is not born. So it says, there has to be a spiritual struggle, self-striving, striving, you know, contemplation, in order to give birth, like the Mary you know, Mary did, to uh, and in Jesus. So everyone has a potential to become a Jesus, or to give birth to Jesus. If the pangs never come, then our child rejoins its origin by the same secret path through which it came, leaving us empty, without the birth of our true self. This is, this is his work from, uh, his uh, prose work, Fihi Mafi, Discourse of Rumi, translated by, again, uh, Ardri. Now, this is his poetry. Your inward soul is hungry, your outward flesh is overfed. The devil has gorged to sickness, the king begs even for bread. The cure is found while Jesus is here on earth, but once he returns to heaven, all hope will have fled. This is from, again, uh, Fihi Mafi. And he, from the Mesnevi, if you see an ugly face in that mirror, this is you. If you see Jesus and Mary, it is you. So wh whatever you perceive, it reflects you. And, and uh, if you, it says in another, of course, in the same context, uh, maybe I didn't include here. If you think of ro rose, you are a rose garden. If you think of wood, you are, you know, uh, uh, like a fuel for the furnace. <coughs> That's how interprets so Suppose he's a child, what matter when he has the life giving breath of Jesus and his purge of vain glory and vain desire? From Leslie Bibi. There are certain lovers of God who, because of their great majesty and jealousy for God, do not show themselves openly, but they cause disciples to attain important goals and bestow gifts upon them. So he's in reference to disciples, Hawari Yuni, disciples of Jesus he's talking about. Such my spiritual saints are rare and precious, and it relates, of course, uh, the friends of God and saints. Some people said to Jesus, and this is of course, we will come to your house. Jesus replied, where is my house in this world, and how could I have a house? He cried and, and aloud, Lord, the jackal's pup have a shelter, because it's a long story, but the son of Mary has has. Uh, has uh, no place. No place. Sorry, mm -hmm. has no place to call home. Uh, this was, uh, has no place to call home. So this is, you know, uh, from his uh, 
because I tried to put them last night, you know, until one o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry for my errors. And Jesus, okay, again, there is a comparison between Jesus' attitude and John. And he says, Jesus laughed a lot. John laughed a lot. And John said to Jesus, you have become exceedingly carefully against all the subtle deceits that you love so much. And Jesus replied, you have become exceedingly unmindful of the subtle mysteries, wonderful graces, loving kindness of God that you weep so much. <laughs> Was this John the Baptist? Yes. Uh, yes. <laughs> so again, one of one of we can have of course each one has what Rumi does here. I, he quotes this, then then he brings up his own lessons. He, he because he says, for example, in, in the very beginning, and let me quote in Persian, uh, has any man a bait man, baitinist? Iklimist, uh, Hazelman, Hazelinis, Talimist. He said, I have, you know, articulated all these couplets. Do you think these are simple couplets? This, each one has a land of wisdom and meaning, like a climate. And my jokes are not jokes, simply jokes. They are there to impart a moral a lesson. So, you know, in the end, he gives his own, of course, uh, moral and teachings. And one of God's saints were, was present at this, at this incident and he was asked, which of these two, meaning John or Jesus, okay, has the highest station? God answered, he who thinks better of me. That is, of course, uh, in reference to Prophet Muhammad, he said the same thing. Uh, however, you think God, you, you know, you have that image of God. So, in other words, I come when, I, I come when you think of me, God speaking to Jesus, each person has an image, an idea of me. Whatever picture he forms of me, there I am. I feel that picture where God dwells. I care nothing for that point of view where God does not exist. <laughs> Cleanse your thoughts, O human, for they are my abode and my dwelling place. And Rumi says, now test yourself as to weeping and laughter, fasting and prayer, solitude and company, and the rest. Which of these is more profitable to you? Then you follow. So there is no one strict way to follow. You can choose whichever you know suits your needs and your demands, in a sense, your aptitude or propensity. So uh, and he says, whichever brings you straighter, straighter on the road, gains you the greatest advancement. Choose that task. Take counsel from your heart, even though others may disagree. The truth is within you. Compare it with the, what others say. When they agree, then follow their course. When they agree with the truth within you. Yes, within you, exactly. Rumi speaks of the spiritual path of the prophets. He says, you know, it's very interesting. And, and path of Muhammad and path of Jesus. He says, it is necess necessary to endure pain to help rid of yourself of selfishness, jealousy, and pride. To experience the pain of our spouses' extravagant desires. The pain of unfair burdens and a hundred thousand other pains beyond all bounds. So the spiritual path can become clear. The way of Jesus was wrestling with solitude, not gratifying lust. That's how he describes the path of Jesus. And the way of Muhammad is to endure oppression and agonies inflicted by men and women upon each other. So, you know, and, uh, adversity, difficulty, and persecution, and etc. So Rumi then suggests, if you cannot go by the Muhammadan way, at least go by the way of Jesus. So you will not remain completely outside the spiritual path. In our religion, the right thing is struggle and difficulty, of course, in reference to Islam. And in the religion of Jesus, the right thing is to retire to cave and mount. This is, of course, his uh, uh, interpretation. Uh, I, can, I can send you, Professor David, you don't have to take notes. The purity and single-mindedness of the Prophet Jesus, the Spirit of God, is the Ruhullah in Arabic, created by the Divine Word Pure. Now, the, here, uh, the commentator on the Mestavi makes references to Ibn Arabi, because Ibn Arabi, about 30 years senior to uh, Rumi. So Rumi must have benefited from Ibn Arabi's uh, wisdom, not directly through his books, but from his student who lived also in Konya, Konebi, who was uh, the transmitter of Ibn Arabi's teachings in Anatolia. So he says, God purged his body of all natural grossness, for he is a spirit incorporated in, in an immaterial body, 
Bedan Mithal Ruhi Narabi gang is Persian Arabic, and that's why he has remained in it for more than a thousand years, from his birth to the present time. So this is again the eternity uh, within us, of course, in the reference to the example of Jesus. Hence, Jesus often represents the most Muslim ideal of spiritual poverty and detachment from the world. In these verses, however, he ty typifies the perfect man, we say, uh, yeah, like a universal man, an insan al kamil Arabic, perfect man, whose otherness has been sublimated and absorbed in the essential unity of the Godhead. This is, again, commentators uh, in the uh, 16th century, whom I worked uh, on Karabi. Okay, now, another narrative from the Masnavi and commentators. When Jesus died, many colored garments <coughs> in his wet, they became one color, pure and white. <laughs> okay, among the, among the miracles which Muslims ascribe to Jesus is the following story. And this is also the, the Bible of the Prophets. Okay, this is the volume. When his mother took him away from school, she apprenticed him to a dyer in, in Jesus. After a while, his master said to him, now you have learned this craft, and I am setting out on a journey. Here are some garments. I have marked on each one the color with which it is to be dyed. And I should like you to finish the work before my return. Then, as soon as he departed, Jesus threw all the garments together into the same dying wet, <laughs> saying to them, by God's name, do you become according to my desire. Ten days afterwards, the master returned and asked Jesus what he had done. Jesus told him, you have ruined, you know, Jesus told him. And then, you have ruined the garments, he exclaimed. But Jesus bade him come and see. Then he threw the garments out of the wet one by one, and the master saw that each was dyed a different color, just as the master had ordered. <laughs> Thereupon he, he marveled exceedingly. He and his pupils believed on Jesus, and they are the apostles or you know, disciples in Arabic. Rumi relates this story of Jesus to the spiritual master's role. Exactly, spiritual master has a role to play like, you know, uh, the master of Jesus and, 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 and Jesus himself that ultimately the wet and large container holding liquids of the unicolority of our Jesus may destroy the value of the, of the wet containing a hundred dyes. So if, you know, a uh, master has the same spiritual power, or charisma, or, or force in a sense, he could, you know, do uh, as Jesus has done. So meaning in the hands of the master, meaning Sufi, all differences turn into unity. True, but still differences are visible. And through his pre uh, precious and efficacious elixir, or kolirum, the discernment becomes mature and ripe. This is what uh, Rumi says about the importance of the Sufi path and the role of the master in this regard. Certainly, it's right to say that God honored Jesus and drew him close so that whoever serves Jesus has served the Lord. Whoever obeys him has obeyed the Lord. But since God sends a prophet in every age, Manifesting by their hand all that was manifested by this hand and more, it behooves us to follow that prophet, not for the sake of the prophet, but for the sake of God. So he's, you know. And, and uh, maybe I can uh, please interrupt me in the time, if, um, uh, because we have also parallel ideas. Okay. And Jesus said, I wonder at the living creature that can eat a living creature. Rumi quotes. Then they literally say, when they interpret this, the literal minded people, this refers to people eating the flesh of animals. This is an error. Why? Because when people eat flesh, it's not animal any longer, but inanimate. Yeah. Once the animal is killed, the living spirit is gone from that flesh. The true meaning of this saying, okay, attributed to Jesus, is that the Sufi master mysteriously consumes the disciple, you know, absorbs him, and takes him within his fold. So, I, I wonder at a process so extraordinary, Rumi says, because of the divine established concord between the disciple and the master, the disciple becomes part of the master, even as the son is part of the father in natural generation, and this bird becomes a spiritual bird, as it's related that Jesus said, God bless him, except a man be born twice, he shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, from the commentary and also reference to Jesus and John. So, uh, in the Sufi path, as we learned from uh, Rumi, the relationship between the master and the disciple is so intimate, so subtle, so mysterious. And the three of the it's called companionship. 
is compared to that of suckling. Like, you know, among the Bektashis and other Sufi order in Anatolia, the Murid, I mean disciple, on being initiated, kisses the hand of the master, who replies, if you now accept me as your father, I accept you as my son. Okay, this is... Jesus was asked, what is the most difficult thing in this world and the next? Rumi said, no. Of course, in the tongue of Rumi, he says, the wrath of God. They asked, what can save us from that? He answered, master your, your own wrath and anger towards others. This is, okay, and again from uh, P. Then he said, what is the security against this anger of God? Jesus said, to abandon time, own anger at once. Heart be not deceived, O heart, by every intoxication. Jesus is intoxicated with God as, sorry, the ass is intoxicated with barley. This is another <laughs> narrative, it's very, very interesting. And I, I guess we can talk about on this, but be a man and do not be afraid of those who take the asses. You are not an ass, be not afraid. O Jesus of the world of time. Candy is not withheld from the ass of Jesus by him, but the ass is naturally pleased with straw. So, and let me finish this and then I will talk to you about it. Rumi derives a moral from the saying of Jesus as follows. When the mind wants to be complained, do the opposite. Give thanks. Do not complain. Because the ass, in a sense, represents the body. And spirit, of course, represents the Jesus. So don't go by the demand of your desires, in a sense. Exaggerate the matter to such a degree that you find within yourself a love of what repels you. Pretending thankfulness is a way of seeking the love of God. Our master Shams, who is master, said, to complain of creation is to complain of the creator. So a similar parable has also been given in another famous book in Persian, Ferdinand Attar, okay, and this is a poetry from him. Since love has spoken in your soul, reject the self, reject. The self that we, that we were pulled, where our lives are wrecked. As Jesus wrote his donkey right on it, your stubborn self must bear you and submit. And Shams also said, hatred and rage lay hidden in your unconscious. If you see a spark sparkling from that fire, extinguish it so that it will return to non-existence from where it came. If you insist on matching anger with anger and promoting the flame of rage, it will spring faster and faster from your unconscious and become more and more difficult to put out. Rumi draws an analogy between the creation of living bird, uh, birds from lifeless clay by Jesus and the transmutation of, uh, by God of a bodily affluence into a form of spiritual life and power that soars up to its own sphere. According to several traditions, of course, uh, in, in, in a prophetic saying, the priests and prayers of the faithful become birds in paradise. So how important it is in Sufi tradition to, you know, uh, the spiritual uh, or the members of, of God. Jesus uh, typifies the creative power with which the same in union with God is invested. He says from Rumi, Seek not you from your Jesus the life of the body. Ask not from you, Moses, the wish of a pharaoh. Jesus pronounced the name of God over the bones on account of the young man's uh, and, and treaty. The Jesus of your spirit is pres present with you. Back aid from him, for he is a good aider. Have pity on Jesus and have no pity on the ass. Do not make the carnal uh, nature lord over your intellect. So you know, there are three, of course, concepts in, 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 in the uh, Mesnevi and in spiritual context and intellect and the soul and the spirit. Of course, in addition, and body, and Rumi gives, uh, you know, uh, an interesting analogies uh, uh, how this for a uh, work, you know, operate within human being. The ass of Jesus took, the, took itself the temperament of the rational spirit. It took its abode in the place of the intelligent. If through Jesus, the spiritual guide, you have become heart heart sick, help too comes from him, do not leave him. Jesus mounted on the ass, again, represents the connection of the spirit with the carnal soul. The nefs, meaning soul, of Jesus was subdued by the power of his spirit, so that its nature became holy and spiritual. Here, Jesus provides the perfect Muslim saint and healer of souls. Khalid to him says the poet, and submit to disciple, discipline, he enjoins on you, however painful. Okay. 
maybe I can stop here because there are many uh, you know, couplets in the next uh, <clears throat> So, in a nutshell, uh, interesting to maybe to, to uh, make mention here. Uh, of course, among 24 or 25 pro prophets, names of the prophets mentioned in the Quran, the uh, most frequently cited is in the name of Moses, then and then Jesus in the Quran. And in parallel to this, of course, uh, Sufis uh, also gives a lot of uh, references, even sometimes, you know, uh, to the extent of uh, uh, leaving aside their own, you know, uh, illustrations, uh, examples from uh, the wisdom of Jesus and, and wisdom of uh, Moses and other prophets. And the, the, the aim of uh, you know, uh, Rumi or even Arabi is to show that, uh, yes, Jesus lived historically, but spiritually he is within us. And he is the symbol of perfection. He's a symbol of humility and humbleness. And there is a way for all of us within, within us to reach that level or try to reach that level, provided that we go through the struggle. And, and this is, of course, spiritual journey within the heart. And so there are lacks, lack of intellect, lack of body, and lack of heart. So, and, and, and for majority of the Sufis, the best way to travel on the Sufi path, a combination or equilibrium between intellect and the heart. And that's, that's, you know, yeah, that's how uh, they describe, and also they, they try to show the role of uh, Jesus, and, and uh, uh, in that sense, of course, the role of Master in this spiritual journey. I guess I can Good. start. Sure. Yeah. yeah, let's, let's just um, walk into some of that together. The, the two things that really bounce up for me from uh, what you have <coughs> led us into uh, that, I, that I'd be interested in just a little more clarification on <coughs> and to think about a little bit with you and then we'll talk together. The one is this, this matter of asceticism mm -hmm. and what, what is that asceticism really all about? Um, <coughs> we have in the Gospels this extraordinary narrative of Jesus going to the desert or into the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And we refer to it as the, the temptation mm -hmm. in the wilderness. And Jesus, at least in the Gospels, we see him gather disciples and being, having a remarkable relationship to women. Uh, certainly for any ancient text. Don't have any other ancient text where you have that kind of relationship. Certainly in the Near East, between a man and various women. And yet this asceticism is, is such an important, important matter, and you've talked about it with Ibn Arabi and with Rumi. So what's the problem? What's the problem in the human mind and the human heart that requires the kind of asceticism which, uh, which you, you've hinted at here? Sometimes within the Christian tradition, this asceticism uh, comes out as the need to deny what uh, what most people would see as the natural gift, the natural desires of being a human being. And in, in my part of the Christian tradition, we make a bit of a distinction between the desires that are given by our being to eat, to love, to, to um, uh, 
to respond to the life of the world as, as gift, the natural desires and what we would call passions. And there is this sense in my part of the Christian swimming pool that um, the passions, the word is a Greek word which means suffering, yes. that is an attempt to identify when one natural <coughs> desire colonizes all the others yeah. and sort of takes over. So the asceticism, ascesis in Greek, the root word for both ascetic, monk, and for athlete. We've got a few athletes in here. I don't know if all of you realize, but all athletes are monastics. All athletes are monks. It's the same word in Greek. Why? Because they must discipline their mind, their heart, their body, their time, their space, their relationships around what they're, what they're going after, what they're trying to perfect. So, in my sense, uh, Bilal, yes. the, the asceticism as, as I read it is is really, a, it's not about denial, it's about perfection. That is, it is to discipline oneself for the sake of becoming, well, it's interesting what you've said here about, about how everyone has Jesus in themselves. Uh, everyone is like, a, like a Mary. Everyone is, and everyone is like Mary. Exactly. So, yeah. Everyone has the capacity to be a birth giver of divine love in the world. And everyone has the capacity to become, in the Christian tradition, we would say to become whole, to become who you are. So the asceticism, I mean, how do you respond to that? This notion that the asceticism is about becoming whole. It's about letting go to become whole. The technical term in Arabic in corresponding with asceticism is Zuf. It's one of the stages in Sufi journey. It's very important. Uh, why? Okay, let me make a distinction. <laughs> right after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, there began this luxury life. Began this? Yeah, like, you know, luxury, like extravagant, you know. Uh, extravagant, uh, uh, you know, uh, attitude of the of the rulers, in particular with the Umayyad, and, uh, around uh, 661 you know, to the death of Ali. Okay. So and the rule, the rulers, the the, the yeah, Umayyads exactly. who exactly. saw themselves exactly. as the so inheritors they become, of the prophet, they become intoxicated with the power. They become intoxicated with power. Exactly. All the military victories. Uh, exactly. exactly. So now there were concerned individuals who came up. Okay. Uh, with uh, a, you know, the spirituality of the Prophet Muhammad to respond. And they have given a number of examples uh, from his companions. For example, how one disciple was bashful and shy. How one of them you know, used to wear, although he was well to do, used to wear a patchy garment. Okay. And uh, it's simple. And uh, so, uh, uh, in this sense, they used also Jesus as a reference, okay, uh, uh, not to be suppressed or controlled or swayed, in a sense, by the allurement, by the power, and uh, uh, by attraction. And so uh, by all means, uh, asceticism is an important stage. It is disciplining the soul and the heart and the body, for sure. It's a discipline. And uh, uh, However, technically, it has been understood as a kind of retreat, also, which is, which is as a must in Sufi tradition. A kind of retreat, of course, to like a self-contemplation, okay. and in, in a sense, uh, turning to yourself, trying to find within you. I don't want to say the truth, but who you are, the discovery, of, you know. And there is this expression in Arabic, "Man arafa nafsak." If you try to discover within your, yourself, yourself, and you will be able to find God. 
So and and and, and <laughs> this this process for them should begin by this you know asceticism. Mm -hmm. And I did not use in pejorative sense by the way. Not necessarily like uh, leaving aside your world pleasures uh, right. and, and no. Uh, and you do you should not be a slave to them, but you should take control of them. Uh -huh. And and this is of course later on was used uh, by the notion of jihad, you know, nafs, jihad and nafs, the greatest spiritual struggle that human being can take when Muhammad was returning from, you know, uh, a war, and he said, now we return from this lesser jihad to the bigger jihad, and people, <coughs> of course, were surprised as well, how come? He said, this is a physical one, but the real jihad is the jihad within you. Within your heart. Exactly. So this in a sense, is the initial part of that spiritual struggle. And, and, and the, uh, it doesn't mean that denunciation of the world, denunciation of, you know, of uh, uh, delights, of the pleasures, no, the balance. And, and the, uh, how can you bring them under your control? Mm -hmm. So therefore, how can you integrate them? Exactly. Zoot in Arabic, meaning become like holy, <laughs> and, and, and uh, uh, become uh, self-contemplative okay, individual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And within the notion of like, as if God is always with you, mm -hmm. and you feel the presence of God. And therefore, <laughs> there is this, this, there is this uh, prophetic saying, and uh, 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 if some, I can write, meaning beautiful in, in English, simply beautiful, good. But when they ask what is it, son, he says, to worship God, you know, as if you see him. Although you don't see him, he sees you. Exactly this is in parallel with this. So it, it's, uh, and, 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 and uh, um, so you put emphasis on, not on your physical power, but spiritual power. And work on that, cultivate, you know, all, all this, uh, um, potential mm -hmm. that you that mm -hmm. God has invested within you. Yeah. If I can just bring up yeah. this the other the other side of this that was so striking to <coughs> me, and then we'll yeah. uh, talk together. Uh, as you talked about this um, this idea that everyone has a Jesus within within themselves, yeah. yes. that lovely way that Rumi has of putting that. <coughs> I was uh, reminded of the central initiation ritual in the Christian tradition, uh, in the ancient church, baptism, and <clears throat> how in the ancient tradition of baptism, when the child is baptized, uh, the child is stripped naked. That is, the way the child presents in the world, these are all about social class, all that, you know, we all, we all wear uniforms. <coughs> Azim here has come with his pink shoes on today and his <laughs> lovely shorts. So he's signaling he, to he, us. He's a Sufi. He's a Sufi. This is the Sufi <laughs> garment here in, here in Alberta. <coughs> uh, at least on the last day of summer. <laughs> so in that initiation ritual, the child is naked the way they were born. And they are immersed in the water Mary's womb in the baptism of the baptismal font's a womb. And it's also a tomb. And it's the place of the second birth. And when the child is taken out and processed around the gathered community, which all want to touch the child, often in the ancient rite, the priest will call out, Christ is in our midst. This child is Christos, the anointed one, Jesus Christ. So there is that interesting way in both these traditions of, of picking up on the notion that at least part of the narrative of Jesus Christ that we find in the scripture, that we find in the Quran, is inclining people, is inviting them, is encouraging them to recognize that 
to use Christian language around this, that the revelation, the unveiling of the mystery of Jesus Christ is at least in part the mystery of what it means to be fully human. 